Bit of a contentious one, this, but should iPads be able to run macOS? I'm seeing a huge amount of comments on YouTube and social media asking for precisely this. But then there are just as many comments from people who are saying, no way, you know, iPads are tablets, not Macs. And as seems to be the norm in the tech sphere these days, neither group seems to be able to understand the other's position. So, who's right? I'd say neither, for the simple reason that we all use our computers and tablets in different ways. We've got different needs, different workflows. And some of those are well suited to iPadOS, some are better suited to macOS. Some work well on a tablet, but others are better on a traditional computer. But let's just consider the argument from both sides. Firstly, just remember the original iPad was designed as a tablet. It wasn't stupidly expensive, and it provided a nice complementary computing device that sat neatly between your iPhone and your Mac. It wasn't sold as a computer replacement. Though, of course, I'm sure there were some who were able to do their email, web apps, and office work, even on those early iPads. Since then, Apple has continually increased the hardware capabilities of the iPad. They've run advertising campaigns suggesting that the iPad is a computer, which it is. And they've created accessories like the Magic Keyboard, which further blur the lines between a tablet and a full computer. Putting Mac-specific M chips into iPads just exacerbates the issue. It's being sold as a genuine computer replacement, which it undoubtedly could be for some workflows but not for every workflow. And the reason for that is that iPadOS development has not progressed at the same rate as the hardware. Now, obviously, there are some apps where you can see the performance improvements that come from new hardware. But in general, for many users, they might not see much difference when it comes to their real-world experience. If you were using, say, an A12X iPad Pro or an M4 iPad Pro, you might not immediately see the differences unless you're using them side by side, but that's not how we work in the real world. So we end up with these amazing iPads with insanely capable hardware and a price tag to match. And not everyone can afford both a high-end tablet and a MacBook. It's not unreasonable to wish for a device that can do both, particularly when the hardware and accessories are already there. It's just the software that needs to adapt. So as a result, there are some who would like Apple to ditch iPadOS altogether in favor of running macOS on the iPad. And the iPad, when it's equipped with a keyboard and trackpad, is technically capable of doing this. But just because something is technically possible doesn't necessarily make it a universally good idea. Now, I get it, two-in-one devices are popular in the Windows world, and there's a reason why devices like the Surface Pro sell really well. And this is an excellent computing device that offers great versatility. But it's probably fair to say that you have to make compromises. It's not the best tablet experience, and it's not quite as convenient as a laptop in some situations. Mac users look at these two-in-ones, and then they look at the iPad Pro with its magic keyboard and rightly wonder why they can't have the same experience. And some would argue that the problem with this is that macOS is just not touch optimized. But I'd also say that Windows isn't massively touch optimized either. If I detach the keyboard from the Surface Pro, some of the UI, like the taskbar, just slightly increases in size to make things easier. Apple could probably quite easily do the same. I'd say the real issue here is that iPadOS is a great tablet operating system. And if you remove that to make it run macOS, then the majority of the target market for iPads would have their experience compromised. And Apple just isn't going to do that. So some are suggesting that the iPad could dual boot, and that would allow the user to switch from iPadOS to macOS. So you have a tablet when you want one, and you can run macOS when you dock it. And I think this is actually a nice idea because it gives each user the choice. And it does seem like it should be possible to do, given that both operating systems have similar underpinnings. iOS was originally built using the kernel and key components of macOS as its basis. But possible is not the same as easy. iOS and iPadOS have been developed for many years since that original build. But OK, what if we allow iPadOS to run Mac apps in some sort of container? After all, macOS can run iPad apps. But what's the desired result? And is this approach going to achieve it? Well, the desired result for many is that they would like to be able to fully tap the performance of a chip like the M4. Will this approach of running Mac apps in some kind of container on iPadOS achieve that? 
well, yes, it might work for some apps, but without the macOS multitasking and file management, how is this any different to pro iPad apps that can use the capabilities of M4? So perhaps this is actually more a case of users hoping for a wider selection of apps, or perhaps getting around that iPad app design methodology, where developers want their app to work across the widest number of tablets, and so they adapt its performance accordingly. But I'd actually say the biggest blockers to intensive workloads on iPadOS are the multitasking and file management implementations. In my opinion, and remember this is just my opinion, it's based on my own experiences and computing needs, but if Apple addresses these things, it would make this incredible hardware much more usable without compromising the brilliant tablet experience. And I think that asking Apple to improve these features doesn't mean that you're asking for macOS on iPad, as some commenters seem to assume. Just start with multitasking. Apple added Stage Manager, and some people really love that but others don't, and I guess you can't please everybody. But here, I really like the way that Samsung has implemented this with DeX. You can switch on DeX mode at any time, and what you get is a more traditional windowed environment that works with mouse, trackpad, stylus, and touch. It's still just running Android apps, but just as with macOS, Windows, or Linux, you can have as many of those apps as you like on screen at whatever size you like. It's intuitive, and it just works, because it's the way we're used to working with computers. And Apple could do something similar with iPadOS. You just enable this mode if you want it, and you switch it off if you don't. When Apple added file management to iPadOS, it was a very welcome feature. And I expect for many people it does the job fine. But if you're using it in anger for a file-heavy workflow, you'll probably experience some frustrations. Take a photographer iPad is a brilliant mobile computing device that really complements the photography workflow. It could be used for rapid review of images or for live camera connections and image edits on the go. But at some point, the photographer has to deal with cataloging and backing up hundreds or thousands of images from their shoot. And whilst it is possible on iPad OS, it would be much easier on a desktop OS. Now, it may well be that your experience with file management on iPad has been faultless but my experience with using it is that it's a bit buggy. And I found that it would hang during larger copies, and I even had file corruptions. And I know I'm not the only one finding these sorts of workflow blockers. Apple has got some of the best software engineers in the world, so I'm sure that they can fix this. And if they do, it would open up the iPad as a genuine computer replacement for more users. And I think that's a pretty reasonable request. Making these changes, though, needs to be done in a way that doesn't compromise the iPad experience for those who want the best tablet experience, which iPad undeniably offers. If you love iPad as a tablet and iPadOS the way it is, that's great. But simple changes like this only improve the offering, providing that they're optional to use and they don't force you to change what you're doing. Could it be that some iPad fans are worried that their brilliant tablet experience is going to be ruined by these people who want to use the iPad in a different way, a way that doesn't make sense to their personal experience? But I don't think you need to worry because I don't believe Apple would ever allow that to happen. Now, a couple more thoughts. I've seen a lot of comments from folks saying things like, just wait for WWDC and see what iPadOS 18 brings perhaps because they're hoping or expecting that Apple will do something to really take advantage of that new M4 chip. If that's you, I'd be cautious with your optimism. Let me just quickly relate a personal experience, which is when Apple first put M1 in the iPad Pro, I had the A12X iPad Pro and I rushed out to upgrade it, thinking that Apple would only be putting a Mac chip in the iPad if they had big plans to launch Pro apps that could use it. I was hoping for Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro, so I went out and bought the one terabyte model so that I could have 16 gigs of RAM, and I waited eagerly for the WWDC announcements, where we got widgets. Now, of course, Apple has now brought those apps to the iPad, and other vendors are bringing their pro apps as well, like DaVinci Resolve. It took two years, of course. The lesson here is don't rush out to buy something on the basis of functionality you hope for. Buy it on the basis of what the thing is right now and I should have known better. And finally, there have been lots of comments around M4 being some sort of revolution in AI. Now, for sure, Apple is going to be announcing new AI features, and I could be wrong, but I doubt those are going to be hardware limited to just M4. 
because all of Apple's recent chips have brilliant MPUs. Uh, that's what they call the neural engine. And the neural engine in M4 is the best yet. But how much better is it? Apple quoted 38 trillion operations per second, or TOPS, which is hugely impressive when compared to other onboard MPUs. And understandably, some have been drawing comparisons with M3's neural engine, which they say is only 18 TOPS. That seems like a giant leap forward, more than double the performance. But there is a similar difference in the quoted TOPS figures for A16 and A17. Yet in real-world tests and benchmarks, the performance difference between those two chips seems much less. Could it be because Apple is quoting TOPS figures based on 8-bit integer operations for the A17 and M4 chips? Whereas aren't the numbers for A16 and M3 based on 16-bit floating-point operations? According to this article I found on Tom's hardware, they're expecting the difference to be more in the range of 5 to 10% in benchmarks. In the real world, it could be more or less than that, depending on the task being completed and the level of accuracy needed. But can we directly compare these TOPS numbers? Even respected tech outlets like Ars Technica have done so, and then they're then being cited as a source on the Wikipedia entry which says the same thing. The difference in performance is probably much closer than those quoted figures might seem. Hello, Dave from the future here just interrupting the video because since I recorded that video, I've had opportunity to test the iPad Pro with the M4 chip. And I wanted to do a Geekbench ML test. Now I realize this is just one benchmark and I need to do more testing, but I was interested to see what the difference might be between M4 and M3. So I've got my M3 MacBook Air here. I ran the same test and it came out uh, with a score of 8,158. Whereas the iPad Pro with the M4 scored 9,460, and that's uh, about a 15% difference between the two. And we'll just cycle through the screenshots here so that you can see the breakdown of the test if you wanna pause the video there to compare the two side by side. Uh, it is important to say that this particular test benefits from RAM. Uh, so the M3 MacBook Air here has 16 gigabytes and the M4 iPad Pro also has 16 gigabytes. So it should be a fair comparison. 15%, it's not the double that some people are expecting, but it is a fantastic generational improvement for M4 over M3. And I'm now really excited to see what Apple does with this additional power and to see these M4 chips in MacBooks. And something else I just want to quickly chip into this video that I saw on Twitter or X last night, and that is that some of the teardowns of the 8 gigabyte iPad Pro seem to show that the two memory chips that are being used are actually 6 gigabytes each. So does that mean that it actually has 12 gigabytes and Apple has disabled 4 gigabytes? Uh, I'm sure that's going to upset plenty of people if that is the case. But it does perhaps mean that when the M4 MacBooks come out, the starting amount of RAM could be 12 gigabytes instead of the paltry 8 gigabytes that we get at the moment. And that would be a huge win, uh, especially for AI tasks that need that memory and uh, to really take advantage of the more powerful graphics processors that are in the latest generation of chips. 8 gigabytes needs to do one. It's a totally inappropriate amount of RAM in 2024. So hopefully that is getting changed. Um, iPad users, I wouldn't get too upset about it because I don't think having 12 gigabytes versus 8 gigabytes with iPad OS will make a jot of difference to the majority of people. Anyway, back to Dave of the past. Now, I'm not an AI expert, so we do need to wait and see what happens at WWDC, but I'd expect the new features to run on all the chips unless that is if Apple chooses to artificially limit things. Obviously, M4 has got the fastest MPU, so it'll run these tasks the fastest, but it's most likely an evolution, not a revolution. The revolution will come from the software, not the hardware. And this is something that sometimes gets lost. Hardware is only half the equation. You also need the software to be able to make use of that hardware. Software features do sell, but Hardware performance figures sell even more, and they're important bragging rights. Apple likes to shout about them, and rightly so, because they're competing with other manufacturers who are doing the same. But a consequence of this is that consumers latch onto these numbers, and fans of the brand love to use the amazing benchmarks to rubbish products like the Galaxy Tab. But the thing is, once a processor is fast enough that you can do all the things that you want to do smoothly, then adding additional performance is of little benefit, especially if you can only see that benefit in certain applications or games. I mean, that's great if you're using those apps and games, but otherwise, 
It's just a bragging right with no real world benefit. For most iPad users looking for a great tablet experience, the iPad 10 at $349 is unbeatable value. Nothing comes close at that price point. But for those spending more on the Air or the Pro, should they be able to run Mac OS to get the most from the hardware? I don't think so. But I do think that Apple could make some relatively minor changes which would improve the utility of the iPad for many without ruining it for those who just want the world's best tablet experience. If you want to buy the top of the range iPad Pro and use it as a tablet for media consumption and light productivity, that's your right. It's your money, spend it how you like. And if you want to buy that same tablet to replace your MacBook and you'd like a few improvements to iPadOS to facilitate that, well, that's perfectly reasonable too. So contentious issue perhaps, and no doubt you have some thoughts to share, but what I'm really looking forward to reading is comments that detail how you're using the iPad. What are the frustrations for your workflow and what are the positives? I do feel that if we share our experiences in a positive and respectful way, we all benefit. On the other hand, if we're belittling the opinions and experiences of others simply because we don't understand their unique needs and use cases, I think we all suffer as a tech community. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks as always for your support, your likes, your shares and your subs. And I'll see you again soon for some more geekery.